that which is good. Unfortunately, because what an individual usually considers good depends upon the values of the society they subscribe to, there is no such thing as universal goodness. However, by establishing a high principle for a society to subscribe itself to we can define what is good in a way that is beneficial to that society. Much of the previous chapters have discussed this already, but for clarity in chivalric humanism the highest principle is the survival of the human species, for while our individual lives are short, the ultimate meaning of our lives can only be fully appreciated when the results of our actions outlive us. If our descendants perish there shall be no one to remember the achievements we accomplished or inherit the wisdom we have acquired during our lives. Therefore, within the framework of chivalric humanism that which is good are those things which ensure the survival of the human species, and these can be multifaceted. Generally, there are actions we can take every day that contribute toward the survival of the human species, and often these actions are simple things like working hard in our occupations, volunteering in our communities or raising children. All of these things contribute toward the stability of our civilizations, which gives the members of our species optimal opportunities to survive. These simple actions are often underestimated in importance because they are commonplace, yet they are essential to our survival. Now, this answer I have provided above creates a lot of further questions such as which actions are deemed good by ensuring the survival of the human species? To answer these questions is why I have employed reason to settle upon some answers. Yet, rather than describe every kind of scenario that could possibly come up and what action would be good or bad within that scenario, I instead created a set of virtues which I will introduce in the next section. These virtues are intended to provide guidance on questions concerning which actions are good in any given scenario. It is important to remember that questions of what is legal and illegal do not define good and evil within the moral framework of chivalric humanism. In an ideal world, laws are only written to benefit the collective whole of society and ensure the survival of humanity, but we do not live in an ideal world. We live in a world where politicians can be tyrants and subsequently the laws that tyrannical governments create often only benefit the tyrants. Sorting out which laws are good, which are evil, and which are neither, requires evaluation of those laws through the lens of chivalric humanist beliefs. Civic virtues benefit societies of peoples. Chivalric humanism is characterized by its emphasis on virtue and excellence while also stressing that its adherents become champions for the rights of others. This means chivalric humanists are encouraged to be contributing members of human communities and not isolationists. Now, there are some religious groups which encourage members to cut themselves off from society and communities that are not strictly part of their religious group, this is not done to benefit humanity or the members, but rather to ensure the leadership retains control over the adherents. While clear systems of hierarchy are needed in any organization, chivalric humanists should never forget they are members of many communities. There is no good reason to ignore this. You cannot change the world by cutting yourself off from it. The best way to bring about change is to participate in society. One should become a catalyst for change by becoming involved in groups and organizations, seeking to create change from within the organizations and thereby the organizations will cause greater changes within the societies they operate in. When discussing how a person should participate in society we must begin with a discussion about virtue. There are certain qualities that I have recognized are necessary for a person to possess in order to individually thrive within the social contracts of human civilizations, and which encourage people to contribute to the collective success of human civilizations. Conversely there are also qualities which detract from a person's efforts to obtain success while living in a community. When adopted en masse by many people within a community these qualities that detract from an individual person's efforts to obtain success result in setbacks to the civilization by creating a collective dysfunction that prevents greater goals from becoming achieved that are necessary for that civilization to prosper. Greater goals are best achieved when the majority possess qualities that encourage the majority to contribute to the accomplishment of these greater goals. This is the basis behind why some actions are virtuous in chivalric humanism and others are not, 
some contribute to the collective positively, and others actively undermine that collective work and sabotage it. No one can be honorable unless he honors humankind. It is virtues that direct the course of a human civilization for virtues determine what qualities that civilization values and which they do not. Civic virtues are of paramount importance for the success of any civilization which incorporates democracy. When final decisions on public matters are made by an absolute ruler such as a dictator, it is the dictator's virtues which influence those decisions. When a broader class of people become the decision makers it is then their collective virtues which characterize the types of decisions made. It is because a single individual is composed of both negative and positive traits of personality that democracy as a form of decision making is considered superior in determining what best protects the interests of the majority. The idea is that the virtue of the collective can check the fault of that same collective. While this is not always the case it has a higher chance of occurring in a democracy than in a dictatorship, and it has the best chance of occurring when the majority of the electorate have a strong sense of civic virtues. This is true even in a republic, for republicanism is a form of democracy where the people democratically select representatives who will then vote democratically for laws and policies on their behalf. Thus, the virtues of the collective are still essential even in a republic, for people vote for representatives that they believe will make decisions that represent their values. Now there are those past philosophers such as Niccolò Machiavelli who advised that a person should only strive to provide the appearance of being virtuous while actually behaving unscrupulously in order to maintain power and influence, but history has demonstrated that Machiavelli was mistaken. A society in which hedonism is rewarded cannot maintain the prosperity created by one stoic generation over the subsequent generations, as the subsequent generations are now raised in an environment where duplicity is viewed as beneficial. In Machiavelli's society, the vast majority of the major houses of nobility which existed during and after Machiavelli's age crumbled in a few generations due to this environment. At present we are viewing similar things occurring in countries such as my United States of America, where people strive only to signal that they are virtuous and do not actually possess the virtues they claim to, instead they convince themselves that simply recognizing something as evil is in itself a virtuous act and feel rewarded. Influential individuals are rewarded for hedonism in the short term but the long-term consequences are suffered by the masses, each subsequent generation born is then brought into a civilization that is further on the decline. This is because as people recognize that duplicity is rewarded they engage in more of it, and this results in a dysfunctional government at both the federal, state and municipal levels, as well as within the private companies that most people are employed by. People seek to get ahead in their careers through character assassination of their betters, seizing upon the desire of the masses to signal how virtuous they are and cause others to lose their influence and power so that an opportunity for themselves to obtain some of it can be had. This has only resulted in destabilization of all aspects of society, with fortunes rising and falling as quickly as they come. It is my belief that if the masses instead valued being authentically virtuous there would be a more stable social environment which leads to more opportunities for the collective whole, as fortunes would need to be created only through virtuous actions. This benefits the members of that society as social contracts are kept by the majority, increasing the stability of that society for the collective.